scripture for we who are the faithful ones, the ones who are seeking to follow the Lord God in ways that often uh, create dissonance given the world and all of the world's issues and challenges. And this passage uh, is a passage that I appreciate as a part of the biblical witness because sometimes we can go through our Christian journey, our, our walk with God, and often believe that in order to have faith, uh, there is no place for doubt, there is no place for questions, there is no place for uh, us to just sit in the fragility of life and ask God, what is going on? Uh, but we do have in the book of Psalms, uh, if you will, a song book. It is a literal uh, hundreds, if not thousands of years of collections of faithful people taking their biggest worries and concerns to God and trusting that if they just had some real talk with God, that God would actually give them a response and perhaps even in God's response, it would strengthen their own faith. And this is, I think, one of the most important uh, parts of what it means to be rooted in faith as this has been our collective theme for 2023, this idea that we are a people who are literally rooted in faith in the disciplines that sustain us, the disciplines that feed us, the disciplines that inform us, that we are not a detached person of faith. Sometimes we've heard it said that you can be so heavenly minded that you know earthly good, and then we often can be the reverse uh, and be so uh, earthly focus that we can't hold God's uh, power and activity in tension with our circumstance as well. Anybody ever been walking through life and you just kind of, you know, feel like, God, I, 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 I got some questions, but I'm a little, a little worried because I don't want to, you know, be honest about how frustrated I am right now because, you know, Big Mama told me not to question you, so, you know, I don't, you know, I, I don't know you as well as Big Mama did. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you today that, amen, you can know God more than Big Mama did. Yeah. And how many know the more you know God, the more you spend time with God, the greater some of our questions may be. And dare I say, you may find a faith that has not yet been tapped into before. Psalms, the book of Psalms, uh, one theologian, I heard him say uh, that uh, often we use our uh, Christian kind of theological framework uh, to uh, find uh, theology in search of experience, which is to say that we start with our confession with God and that then produces experiences with God. So it is like, you know, I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And so that then produces a series of experiences that flow out of my understanding of God. Theology, looking for experience. But there are some uh, moments in our lives where we will start from the opposite space. We won't start with a theological declaration looking for experience, but we will start with our own experiences and go looking for God. Sometimes there are some things that have happened or will happen in our lives that your confession cannot fully express or exhaust. And so you take a step back and say, God, I got an experience, and in my experience, I need to go looking for you. I need you to help make sense of my experience. And this is indeed one of the such passages you have, the writer of the book of Psalm, this particular Psalm, David, uh, the one who had a, a, a heart after God, he's described, and yet David had a lot of blood on his hands. 
David, you know, was stepping out with folk that was not his wife and partner. David had a whole lot of dysfunction in his household. And yet David found himself constantly trying to make sense of his trouble. I don't know about you, amen, but it is good to identify with people you know who are exemplary in the eyes of God, and yet their humanity shines through to remind us all that God has room for our human challenges and weakness. And this is Psalm, verse number 13. The scripture says like this, how long, O Lord? Somebody say, how long? How long? How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? This is David talking to God. How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider... And answer me, O Lord my God, give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken. Verse number five, but I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation, and I will sing to the Lord because God has dealt bountifully with me. The word of God. For us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk simply from the topic today. Time is on our side. Time is on our side. Come on, let's pray for a few moments. God, bless the word of God that has been read for we who are the people of God, we ask you to hide your words in our heart so we won't sin against you. And as I stand to preach and teach your word, send your anointing that makes it all easy. And may the hearer find hope in life and salvation in these words that are life to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. Look at somebody and tell them, time is on your side. Tell them that time is on your side. Now, this is the framing, I hope, of a month of anniversary celebrations because it is important to mark time, to have a set-aside celebration of benchmarks, of mountains and valleys and uh, defeats and triumphs. The whole of our lives are always defined by the total sum of the vicissitudes of our journey that you and I are not just fully defined by our victories. Neither should you be fully defined by your defeats. But the whole of your life, when you take it all together, it ought to remind us that God's presence and faithfulness to us over time is a great foundation for faith and trust that no matter what comes my way, if I can just ride it out, God's faithfulness will win out over time. Now, it's worth saying that this may not necessarily transfer evenly in every situation, or ought, it ought not be trusted the same way in every situation. I, you know, uh, have been captivated by a number of challenges that folks out in the middle of the ocean have been, 
you know, chasing for lots of reasons. I think testing, I don't know if it's the faithfulness of God or the fragility of their own humanity. Uh, you know, I was watching a few folk who were on a boat and they were watching sharks just kind of circling around them out in the water and one of the guys got his feet and sat over the side of the boat while the sharks are circling. And I was thinking to myself, man, you must have great faith okay. in God. <laughs> Much more faith than I have. <laughs> Amen. And, you know, eventually, you know, the shark did what sharks are prone to do and they see live meat tap in the water, just kind of reached up and touched someone. And he got drug under, and thankfully he survived. But then I saw another young man on a cruise ship jump overboard. I don't know if they was doing a TikTok challenge. I don't know what got into him. And it appeared there was some sharks or something, and he got, maybe got pulled underneath the cruise ship, and he still lost his sea. I'm sure he did not survive, tragically. And then we saw the Titanic, divers, people drive, diving down to the deep recesses of places not known to humankind. And the, the pressure of their, I don't know if it was a ship, it certainly wasn't a boat, submarine, whatever it was, it, it, it literally got crushed by the external pressure of the water and the depths they were in. And all of those experiences at sea, number one, made me realize why I don't get in boats, praise God. No, just play. I do, I, 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 get, I get in a cruise from time to time, but my feet are staying in the boat. My thing is if Jesus, amen, I, you know, Jesus told, uh, who's that, Peter, they saw Jesus walking on water. And Jesus told Peter, come and, come and meet me in the water. I'd have been like, I don't know, Jesus. Uh, my faith ain't there yet, because I'm one of them brothers who like to keep my feet in the boat. But it is a certain kind of risk adverseness that some of us rightly have employed as an act of survival. Right? Like, not many of us are running after risky thrills because life has been so hard for some of us. We got a nice little defense mechanism. It's like, I don't need to go looking for trouble because too often trouble comes and finds me wherever I'm at. And it is this sensibility that trouble may be ever present or present enough in the life of a believer where I don't have to test God's faithfulness to determine God's ability to keep up with what's happening in my journey. That God is indeed tapped into the intricacies of my life. Now, this week we've seen how our journey of faith has been tested. Some of us have had personal challenges, and we've had to sit at our cubicle, in our home, at the park, on our job, walking through the neighborhood, and we've had to have a sense of inquiry with God, Lord, why and how long will this go on? Some of us have had to endure this through relationships and through family dynamics and through our own physical challenges. Anybody ever had a, you know, a truth pill with God, some real talk time with God and say, God, how long? You know, I, I, I remember the first time I heard this how long refrain, it wasn't from the psalmist, it was from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. They used to play these speeches for us all the time and you heard Dr. King said, how long? Not long, right? You know, I can't say it like Dr. King or else, you know, I'd have a much better 
oratorical, amen, platform. Somebody say amen. But this, 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 this was the first time in the context that I heard this and it is no accident on today where we literally are seeing in about 59 years ago, July 2nd, 1964, was the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Lyndon B. Johnson passed the second of three major civil rights acts that literally sought to obliterate the separate but quote unquote equal conditions of non-white folks and women in this country. That the Civil Rights Act did several things in 1964. It literally ensured that voting rights was extended to everybody and it normalized uh, the registration process for federal elections. Why? Because in many people's experience across the country, in order to vote, they had to register locally and the requirements to vote were so arbitrary. They would, in certain states, uh, invite particularly folks to come register to vote, and they would have what they called these uh, voting codes or tests. And they would ask mostly black folks to uh, recite the whole Constitution as a condition for them to be able to vote. Or they had to recite some preamble or, or a certain part of the Constitution. And they made the right to vote so inaccessible that the feds had to pass a national civil rights act to ensure voting was available to everyone and they could not have their vote thrown out or suppressed. There was the public accommodations component of the civil rights act which ensured that you and I who are black or Latino or indigenous uh, who had a lot of melanin in our skin we could literally eat in a restaurant and not have to be served from the back door uh-huh they uh, did away with uh, the inability of us to stay in hotels when we traveled this is all 1964. My father was literally 17 years old when this was passed. Tomorrow my father will turn 79. Praise God, he's not here. He's having a, having a walk down memory lane in Goldsboro, North Carolina this week with my brother. But, but it's important to appreciate that there are people who were literally teenagers when this law was necessary just so they could move throughout the world and exist in this particular society. Title four of the Civil Rights Act, desegregation of public education. Title uh, seven of the Civil Rights Act, equal opportunity, um, equal employment opportunity, which meant that you could not discriminate on people by the basis of their race, their gender, their sex, their religion, uh, 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 that these were all a part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed today almost 60 years ago. Yeah. And isn't it a shame that just this week we've seen the Supreme Court chip away continuously at massive parts of the civil rights gains that so many of our communities have had to literally fight for since we found ourselves here as enslaved folk in a foreign land. Now this serves as a backdrop for you and I to appreciate a couple of things. Number one, that there was and there continues to be a need for all of us to be conscious that in spite of God's activity and presence in our lives, there will be moments where things will be against God's intent and certainly harmful to us. And in the biblical text, when you find, as I stated, experience in search of theology, you have moments in your life that don't seem to line up with your confession about God. There is a practice that you and I ought to lean into to help us have space to make sense of all that is happening. And that practice is called lament. 
And you see, one of the most important things about being rooted in faith is that we need to literally exhaust all of the tools of our faith in order to sustain ourselves through the highs and the lows of our lives. Lament is an actual practice of Christian faith that is given to us so we can make room for disappointment and question and inquiry time with God. How many of you have ever had a bad tooth, praise God? And, and, and you know, you know, you needed to go to the dentist, but you, you just... You know, you and the dentist have a very important uh, uh, agreement, praise God, that, you know, I don't fool with you and you don't fool with me. Somebody say amen, right? Because, you know, uh, I, I took my daughter to the dentist this week and I thank God we got a great dentist that knows how to work with kids because my daughters, you know, they, they, they were... They were <laughs> frightened of the dentist but there was a child in that in that chair back there I was thinking to myself I'm glad my daughters have experience with this dentist because I was nervous praise God walking in and you just hear blood curdling just no and I'm daddy and mommy and I don't want it and stop and I was like oh my god God, somebody come save this child. Yes. Hey man, I almost ran back there myself. But I trusted the dentist, because I know the dentist, this dentist knows, knows what, what, what she's doing. Uh, and it helped me to be, be cognizant that sometimes it may not be about the dentist, it may be about the patient. That'll get you on the way home, praise God. But, but, but the, the, there's a moment, there's a time in your life where your understanding with your dentist kind of gets overridden by the pain in your mouth. And you kind of suspend your agreement of not participating with dentistry. And you show up and say, the pain of the dentist cannot match the pain in my mouth. So I'm going to show up to the dentist, and I'm going to let the dentist work on me. And I'm going to ask the dentist a whole lot of questions. I'm going to ask the dentist, how can I avoid another trip to you? Uh, you know, the dentist say, come see me every six months. You'll be like, mm, you know, how can I avoid that? they would be like, well, if you brush and if you floss and if you, you know, do it all two, three times a day, I mean, you, you still should come see me, but you probably won't have holes in your teeth and pain in your mouth, and, and you can outlast it a little while longer. Why am I using a dentist? Because I want you to appreciate that sometimes a lament is your undesired regular appointment with God. A lament is an opportunity for you to go to God and sit in a discomfort that only God can exist with you in. You can sit in misery, grief, and pain by yourself. But when you sit with misery, pain, and grief in the presence of God, you are engaging in the act of lament. Everybody say lament. In the biblical text, lament is described as four things. It is a situation of distress. It is a cry out to God for help. It is, listen, a waiting for God to answer. And then it is God answering. And it is finally capped off with a joyful response from me. It's a five step process of lament that often you and I have to have a regularly scheduled appointment with. Why? Because when you and I can spend time with God in our questions, inquiry, grief, and pain, it opens up space for God to reveal things to us we have never or would not necessarily tap into. 
And this is where I believe the promise of God being on our side is so powerful because there is a space where God can teach and coach you and I on how to get through challenges if we engage in the practice of lament. What is the first thing that lament will often teach you and I? Uh, it will teach us, listen, that our problems and troubles may be real, but they don't last always. Lord, have mercy. Somebody say, my trouble is real, but it won't last always. You see, one of the great things that you see in this passage, you see the acknowledgement of trouble. And I don't want you, child of God, as we experience trouble on the horizon, trouble in our homes, trouble in our communities, troubles on our job, troubles in our politics, troubles in the world. I don't want you to be a follower of Jesus who simply ignores all the trouble because you so-called have faith. No, faith is not asking you to ignore your troubles. Faith is telling you to name your troubles one by one. But be mindful that these troubles won't last always. Now, there is this thought that faith is used by some as an opiate for the masses. It is used by some as a tool to divide and to oppress. That is one use of faith I will acknowledge. Because there's some mean-spirited folk in this world who love to use their faith as a means to torment other people. What kind of faith and what kind of God needs little old you to defend it? I tell folk often, if your God requires me to harm somebody on God's behalf, I am serving a puny God. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Because if God is great, why does God need you to do any great thing? As we said some weeks ago, we are partnering with God to heal and steward creation, not be the judge, jury, and executioner in creation. And some of us need to uh, you know, do a little checking of the God we follow. Because I believe that if God is God, and I do believe God is God, God does not need your help. He's fixing anything or anybody. Hello, somebody. If anything, God's given us an invitation to partner with God to love, to heal. Dare I say, ourselves first. Because how many of you know it is a full-time job to love yourself the way you deserve to be loved? Lord, I wish I could talk to somebody in here today. Amen. It's a full-time job to break through all of the negativity and all of the, the, the junk that's been placed inside of us over time. But I believe time is on your side, child of God. Because God knows how to do the work inside of us. Woo, that, and that, that, that's, that's the first question I want you to wrestle with today. What kind of inside work needs to be done? I mean, I, 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 I got this from this first part of this text where it says, how long must I bear pain in my soul? Yes. Sorrow in my heart. I mean, those are internal places where trouble and, and anxiety and grief and depression will often live. Verse number three, so powerfully stated, if you don't interrupt this and give light to my eyes, listen, I will sleep the sleep of death. Whew. When I read that, that to me was like a deep articulation of depression. It was a deep articulation of deep grief and mourning. But I love how the scripture says in this passage, give light to my eyes, which means that God knows how to help us get some of the inner healing that is necessary for us to wade through the difficulties of our current, past, and future inner struggles. And I want you to believe this, child of God, that if you and I can commit to over time 
the work of inner healing and care. God meets us in that healing work and over time there is no inner pain that God can't help us heal from. And God uses science and medicine and nature and practices to help us do the inner work. There are forms of prayer in our Christian tradition. There's contemplative prayer. There is prayer uh, where you are literally using your mind to connect with the beauty of creation. There is prayer where you take stock of yourself. There is prayer, communication with God. That literally is a tool to help deal with the inner healing of your soul. Some of us also get prayer and healing and help from our therapists. How many you know going to therapy is an act of prayer? Especially when you got a good one, amen. Amen. When you don't have a good one, you still praying, Lord, I hope this works out. (laughs) But when you got a good therapist, you're not hoping it works out. You're thanking God because I am seeing you heal me over time. How many witnesses in here that God has done some healing work with us over time? Uh, and, and the second thing the scripture lifts up that I think is worthy of our acknowledgement and celebration, listen, is that our enemies are formidable, but they won't win. Amen. This is a great thing about the men, I believe, right? Is that it gives you space to do the inner work, but it also makes you clear about the external threats and enemies that you need to attend to as well. I love when, you know, Jesus was getting ready to cast out the demons from uh, this little, uh, th- this young man. I don't know if you remember that passage in the book of Matthew, I think Mark and Luke, when Jesus runs into the demoniac, Jesus runs into this, this, this demon-possessed young man. The scripture says that the young man was out in the tombs and he was killing himself and harming himself and, and, and totally cutting himself. And Jesus comes up to this young man and Jesus first says what is your name demon said my name is legion for we are many I can't preach all of that today but one thing this that that verse reminded me of when I read this verse is that sometimes we need to name our enemies some of us are not too clear about our enemies And some folks, some systems, some ways of life are enemies to your and my well-being. White supremacy is an enemy. Misogyny is an enemy. Capitalistic exploitation is an enemy. Materialism is an enemy. Uh, 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 the, the destruction of creation is an enemy. Uh, the the, 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 the uh, Patriarchy on your job is an enemy. The gaslighting uh, on, on your job is an enemy. Some folk you in relationship with, they may not be your enemy, but they ain't your friend. <laughs> Hello, somebody. And some of us need to take time to name the enemies so you can be clear about their engagement with you. You know, there is nothing worse than thinking an enemy is your friend. And you're surprised when they're trying to take your voting rights away. You're surprised when they're trying to keep your kids from learning about the history of racism and exclusion in this country. You're surprised when they're continuing to push drugs and guns disproportionately in communities across the country. You're surprised when uh, they then over police and then over incarcerate and then over sentence. And we're like, man, I thought these folk was my friends. No, <laughs> these folk not your friends. They are your enemies. Now, Jesus said to love your enemies, which just means that you can wish the best for them without allowing them to make the worst for you. 
It don't mean you just keep letting them harm. That is the weakness of a certain expression of Christian faith. Because, you know, even Jesus, when, you know, Jesus got fed up with some of these folk, he loved them out the temple. Somebody say amen. He said, I love you so much. <laughs> I'm going to give you a new address because you don't belong here. Somebody say amen. I'm not telling you to love nobody out the temple, but I am telling you to put some boundaries in place. Love your enemies from a distance. Love your enemies and defeat them uh, and the power they hold over the lives of God's vulnerable people. Name your enemies, but realize that your enemies have an expiration date. That God will not allow your enemy to have power indefinitely over you. And this is where I think time is on our side because God is always showing us that if you can just hold out for a little while, you will watch the destruction, the defeat and the demise of those who stand against your healing, your liberation and your freedom. And this is where I want you to recite to yourself the scriptures that tell us fret not yourself because of evildoers uh, for they will be cut down like the grass. Uh, it means that you don't have to spend a whole lot of time worrying about the enemies, the foes, the, the those who come against you. You ought to name them so you're clear about them. Uh, but can you imagine what it would be like uh, if you name your enemy and then put God next to them? Uh, you said to myself, is my enemy ever greater than my God. I'm here to tell you, no, your enemy is never greater than your God. I don't believe there is an enemy you will face that when you put that enemy next to God, that God will not find a way for you to defeat that enemy. And I'm here to tell you, you can defeat your enemy without killing them. If your enemy is a person, you ain't got to kill them in order to defeat them. But God has shown me over time that the way I defeat my enemies uh, that have human flesh uh, is to steal the power they have uh, to cause you and I harm. Uh, I want you to stay alive uh, because as long as you are breathing, uh, you got an ability to repent. Uh, you got the ability to turn from your wicked ways. Uh, you got an ability to learn from your mistakes. Uh, so I don't want you to die. Uh, I just want you to leave me alone stop talking to me that way stop passing those kind of laws stop giving me hell on my job stop giving me trouble in my neighborhood I need somebody who's willing to beat your enemy but leave them alive because when God puts God's hand on your enemy how many of you know your enemy's mind got to turn your enemy's heart got to flip. Uh, your enemy's spirit got to change. Uh, do I have a witness that can say uh, that over time, uh, God turned my enemy into my friend. Uh, God turned my enemy into my stepping stone. Uh, God found a way uh, to make me not to kill somebody. Uh, but God said, I'll fight the battle for you uh, if you just stand still. Uh, see the salvation of the Lord. Uh, I will turn that situation around. Uh, somebody shout hallelujah. And that's why I love how the passage ends. Uh, it says that God, what will I do while I wait? Uh, it says I will throw myself. Uh, I will throw myself uh, into the arms uh, of the living God. Uh, when was the last time uh, you threw yourself uh, into God's arms? Uh, I dare you. Uh, you could be standing uh, or you could be sitting, uh, but just throw yourself. Uh, say, God, I'm throwing myself. I'm throwing myself into your arms. Bye-bye depression. I'm throwing myself. Bye-bye low self-esteem. I'm throwing myself. Bye-bye addiction. I'm throwing myself in the arms of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. 
He says, I'm celebrating your rescue. Anybody want to celebrate? Want to anticipate? Want to have a, a, a expectation that God will rescue me? God will rescue you. God will deliver you. God will help you. Somebody shout hallelujah. I'm singing. I'm full because God is telling us time is on your side. Time is on your side because the greater God, he is everlasting from generation to generation. Thou art God. Shout hallelujah. stand with me grab someone by the hand just look at him in the face and tell him time is on your side come on tell him that time 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 God's time is on your side I know the devil thinks that the devil's got a thing he's holding over your head but I want you to know today that the devil has an expiration date Woo. My daughter's been going through a summer program, learning how to cook. One of these Oakland white people programs, I thank God for it. Lord, have mercy. See, seven hours out the house, doing something productive. Besides being on that, these call the TV the idiot box. Um, this is the insanity box. Somebody say amen. She came home with all her new knowledge. We had milk and meat in the... So I go brown to meat, we're going to have spaghetti and tacos. Okay. Just the fact she said, okay, I was surprised. I said, thank you, Jesus. This kid had a nerd to come to me and said, Daddy, this meat is expired. I said, what you talking about, girl? It's June 26th. This says the expiration date is June 23rd. Girl, you better put that meat in that skillet in there. <laughs> so she come up in here with all this new, new information. <laughs> now they told me the cereal box has an expiration date. Yeah, yeah. Syrup has, I said, syrup don't have no expiration date. I want you to, I, 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 the, uh, maybe the cereal. <laughs> but syrup, come on now. I've been, I, 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 I. I I think I'm still using syrup from my mom in them's house 20 years ago. <laughs> but she was so convinced about this expiration date that she refused to internalize what I was telling was good for her. Could you believe that some of the enemies and problems in your life have an expiration date? And couldn't you be like Sarai, Naomi, and say, I refuse to keep this in my life. This is expired. Hello, somebody. As you hold the person's hand next to you, I pray that you ask God to remind them time is on their side. And there's some things that have expired, whether they be problems, whether they be enemies. Things that are on the inside of you, internal troubles. They won't last always. They have an expiration date. They may be external enemies. Whew. I'm here to tell you, your enemies cannot outlast God's faithfulness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your enemies have an expiration date. Come on, remind your neighbor, squeeze their hand gently and just tell them time is on your side. It's on your side today. Trouble ain't gonna be hovering in your life always. So just hold out, create some time and wait with God. I know it seems like the Supreme Court is lining up against us, but guess what? Time is on our side. 
I know our relationships seem to be fracturing at their most foundation point, but time is on your side. I know your children, your body, your career, career, our community, it seems fragile, but time is on our side. God will not let us lose. Because time is on our side. Bless the hand I'm touching, God. You know what they need. You know the particular challenges they face. You know the struggles privately that they carry. You know the enemies that are literally warring against their well-being. I pray today, God, you will remind them that time is on their side. I pray you will remind them that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Hallelujah. I pray that you will keep teaching them how to sit in a place of lament when necessary to carve out place to grieve with you. Carve out places to ask you hard questions. Carve out places with you to sit in places of gloominess and trouble because God I'd rather be with you in trouble than be without you in places of well-being and victory give my neighbor what they need today in Jesus name we pray lift those hands right where you are say it's me oh Lord and I stand in the need of prayer it is not my mother It is not my father. It is not my sister. It is not my brother, but it's me, oh Lord. And my hands lifted to you are my antenna. I need to make a connection with you, God, right now. I know that you are here wanting to connect with me, but the picture is too fuzzy. It's it's, it's, it's not clear enough, so I'm moving my hands, waiting to get the right connection. Hallelujah. I'm moving my body, God, because I know you can meet me in my movements. I'm trusting you, God, that you are able to do anything but fail. So save me. Somebody say, save me. Heal me. Somebody say, heal me. Deliver me. Somebody say, deliver. God, give me what I need today to defeat the enemy of my soul. And we'll say, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them time is on your side. Tell them that. Tell them time is on your side.